Hello, guys, and uh, welcome to our workshop. I think this will be way less formal than yesterday. So, um, yeah, why not? Huh? We'll have a chat together. We will go over some stuff we prepared. Um, we I, we wanted actually to enable our camera, but our Wi Fi connection on this device is kind of poor. So, um, don't want to risk it now to drop out. Um, so we probably will just leave it turned off. Um, yeah. Do you want to wait for Jason? I don't know. I presume he's just getting out of this talk um, now. Uh, so for the... Oh, Rob is asking. Uh, yeah. He's, okay. He's here already. Um, for the structure of this workshop, we thought that we will probably go through the algorithm again, um, this time a bit more slowly or um, in the yeah speed that, that everyone can follow it. And we can also see if there are questions, if we skim to, through something too quickly yesterday. Uh, you can ask questions all the time. Um, then we will probably we'll talk about a few other um, bits and pieces that we uh, didn't get to talk about that are kind of relevant for um, ICO and IR3. Um, and if there was any questions from the IR3 register allocation review um, that people still didn't understand thing, we can also go through the code and uh, probably for ICO too. Um, we have, I think Daniel has the code open here. Um, yeah, so the, the reason I originally did this talk was that, um, that, that I originally wanted to do this talk was that people were asking me on, um, when reviewing the IR3 register allocator, like, hey, do you have any resources um, that explain the basics of this, like any overview? And there's all of the existing resources are started off with like, oh, this is the definition of a chordal graph, and this is a perfect coloring, and then hand waved away all of the live frame splitting, the details of live frame splitting. Um, so we, I hope that this uh, will be useful. And so if there's something that can be done more effectively uh, in person than in code review, which is uh, always a little tougher so, uh, for uh, big complicated things, then we can also do that here. And then we can also uh, lose a few words on register allocation validation. And eventually, um, maybe present even a path towards uh, SSA based register allocation without doing it directly on SSA. Um, if you understand the theory behind it, then you might already figure there is a way to do this uh, SSA-based register allocation style on um, after translating out of SSA. We will maybe briefly talk about it just to give the opportunity if you're interested to uh, in converting an existing register data um, to be able to do that. Yeah. I Please let us know if our connection gets bad, because I already see that red light. There. Uh, or if you don't understand anything, you can also at any time basically unmute yourself and ask a question. Um, otherwise, I think we just jump into it. Um, uh, I, should we wait for Jason? Because he said he was interested. Sorry, uh -oh. I didn't get that. Uh, I was just asking, should we wait for Jason? Should we, Jay? I think he's doing his own breakout on ray tracing, which is a little sad because I know he really wanted to be in here. Uh, it's not right now. He he just finished his talk like a couple of minutes ago, I think. Yeah, I think he's going to put one together, but later. Oh, okay, later. I misread that then. Okay. It just joined. Hi, Jason. Uh, what am I putting together later? 
we were more on the introduction, so you didn't really miss anything. Okay. Um, so the idea is that we go over the algorithm once again, more slowly, and to allow asking questions and see if everything is clear. Um, yeah. So, so let's skip the SSA form stuff. Yeah, I let's think. Skip the background. I hope SSA is clear for everyone. And also the deconstruction, I assume that it's pretty clear that you have to insert copies at the um, control flow edges. Um, Keep going. Also, Keep register going. location itself should be a topic that is clear and All the time. idea why. Okay, yeah, so let's start it here, I guess. Yes. Um, yeah, so hopefully the kill flags thing is pretty clear. Um, the way the actual algorithm works is very simple. You just walk backwards uh, and keeping uh, track of what's live, and then uh, the first time something pops up while walking backwards, you add the kill flag to it. Um, that was one of the most straightforward parts when I was implementing it. I uh, didn't even bother looking at what ACO did because it seemed pretty straightforward. Yeah, it just indicates that the variable is not no longer used after this yeah. moment. The only thing, the only reason I really put it in here is a uh, it's um, an important data structure wise, like you know what actual data structure you use. So it's kind of different from, for example, linear scan, where you keep track of the ranges instead. Um, and then this is like the core algorithm that um, stays the same pretty much throughout the entire thing, um, although it gets kind of wonky as soon as you start to do live rent splitting. Um, it, the, the whole idea of like having this uh, register file and for each register keeping track of whether it's uh, available or in use by some value is kind of the core idea here. Um, and that gets way more complicated and uh, tricky as you add more and more stuff on top of it. But the basic idea stays the same. Um, just add kill flags. Uh, sorry, use the kill flags to figure out if uh, you need to remove it from the file and then pick something from the available things. And all of the uh, secret sauce, all the hard parts, is going to be uh, put in pick fizzers, which I. I'm thinking now, I should have called it get reg because that's what Eco and IR three call it. Um, that's kind of a mistake, but whatever. Yeah. So for the actual algorithm to pick a physical register, there's like there's plenty of choices. For example, we use uh, in Echo we use best fit at the moment, um, and in IR three they use some round robin to um, to figure. The, the register, which is li li likely a, a good fit. <laughs> yeah, it works better because we have uh, these uh, knocks. Um, so, un so un like in the RDNA two, we have, but unlike in the original AMD instruction, there's a not there's a delay between writing and reading a register. So, so um, pipeline stalls. So pipeline stalls. So uh, the Round Robin does a really good job at avoiding that. Um, I know in the graph calling algorithm that was originally proposed, the Round Robin, but Round Robin actually does even better with this because rather than doing Round Robin on some random order picked by uh, the core the graph calling algorithm, you're doing Round Robin on the actual source code order, which is what you really want. Um, so when I did that, it went from being net negative in terms of NOPs into net positive. Um, so are there questions up to this point? Hi, hi it's uh, Tim Ranoop here. Um, I was just wondering about the, the round robin thing, because something that um, was pointed out in one of the papers about this is that round robin gives you a chance to do to do better in post RA scheduling, do it, does um, does ACO do any post uh, post RA scheduling that could take advantage of that? Um, so mm, ACO not yet. Here, but IR3 does. Um, it does do post RA scheduling, and uh, like I said, um, doing a round robin made it dramatically better. Um, so I started out with the best fit because I was just copying from ACO, and then um, 
IR3, and then I changed it to round robin um, once I got the register presser estimation working, and then that improved uh, the quality of post RI scheduling dramatically from um, worse than the original, which was doing round robin, but on graph coloring to even better than the original. Um, yep. Which I'm hypothesizing is because I'm doing round robin in the source code order. Which is going to be better. Yeah. And I take your point about on um, RDNA that you have those pipeline stalls, so round robin helps you on that as well. Yeah. yeah. I think, Echo, you're, someone's working, uh, Timur is working on the post RA scheduler. Yeah, Timur wrote some uh, post RA uh, scheduler um, that's a bit work in progress and needs more refinement and stuff, but we will definitely look into that again. And then we might also switch to round robin, but um, yeah. Uh, that's um, by the way, uh, what's your IRC nickname? Because I would be interested in talking to you about your post RA scheduler. Uh, yeah. okay. yes. um, then let's look into handling control flow because here stuff gets more interesting. Um, I assume most people know the classic data flow algorithm. Um, you, uh, again, this is uh, something you can find online, described many different sources. Um, and it's just the data structure there is just the live in and live out. It's set. I think that's how uh, both ACO and IR3 handle it. Handle it. Um, and in addition, you have these kill flags. So now you do the same like dance of walking backwards, but start out with the live out set instead of with uh, nothing. Also, keep in mind that uh, now a variable can have multiple kill flags in different blocks. Like it can be uh, killed once in yeah. the then branch lag, and then it can be killed again in the else branch lag. And uh, in a loop, it's important to note that a variable can have no kill flag at all, and it can just be killed uh, in the end of the loop, kind of. Um, if a variable is defined outside of the loop and then used inside the loop. Um, dominance, the, hopefully everyone's, in, we kind of assume you know SSA. So um, can you, yeah? Uh, going back to, to liveness and kill flags, maybe you said this and I missed it, but um, how do you handle the uh, weirdness around disabled uh, channels for, say, SGPOs? Where um, so SGPOs don't have disabled channels. That's well, the thing. You have they're stuff that's alive even if it's not, like, it's alive in portions of the IR where if you just look at the classic, like, no-based control flow graph, it looks dead. Um, yeah, so the way Echo handles that, well, do you want to talk about that? Yeah, so in Echo, we have a linear and a logical control flow graph. So we clearly we basically do two different sets of life in and life out variables. Once the um, and the um, uniform values basically follow the linear control flow graph, and um, the life in and life light off light out sets um, are along the edges of the linear control flow graph, and the VGPRs. Um, are handled along the logical control flow graph, and where the and so fee nodes and stuff, for example, might have different numbers of arguments depending upon their uh, whether it's like a logical fee or a linear fee. Um, yeah. So the second point, I think, yeah, Connor can, I think, better talk about if you have implicit control flow um, instructions. So. And not having this linear control flow graph and still be able to, um, uh, yeah. That's a bit tricky. I don't I, honestly, I don't remember exactly how it works on Intel, but um, I remember if you watch the talk a bit later, I mentioned how um, because these V nodes are supposed to happen along the control flow edge, if you have a critical edge, um, then it becomes a problem. Um, because you can't insert the fix-up code, and so you need to insert an edge, a block along that edge. Um, but the problem is that 
uh, these like linear edges that you add to model the like the, the what the machine actually does. Well, those are critical edges. Um, so if you just add the edge from the if to the else in your simple if else, um, then it's going to be a critical edge. And in ACO, they can kind of get around that. Um, and there, there's a nice graph they will try to find again um, by because uh, you have the hardware has complete control. You have complete control over the hardware. So you just go and insert a bunch of empty blocks. Um, yeah, and um, then you get a picture like like this. Um, yeah. So what you can see here is that. Um, uh, divergent, divergent branching in ECHO is actually done as two branches, and one, you for the and and another one for the else, and we remove both critical edges by inserting like linear extra blocks. Um, and those linear blocks don't actually correspond to anything in the original shader. They're just there in case uh, well, the insert, the invert thing inverts the exact mask, but the the then and else linear blocks are just there to insert any extra to hold any extra copies you might need to generate in RA um, if there are fee nodes. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, um, so if it's possible, like the way with normally with implicit control flow, um, you only have the bottom picture. So if you can insert. So the, on, on the bottom picture with the logical then and else, um, the, you, you, uh, the linear edge is just a single edge from the then to the else, which is then uh, a critical edge. So if you can somehow insert a basic block between them, which is basically would be with like no mask enabled, um, with nothing enabled before, before turning off the, the exec mask and then before turning it on for the else, then you can um, get around that problem. But otherwise, uh, you have to, I don't know, resort to some hacks. That, that actually is some hack possible, and uh, we can get to that later, I think. Yeah, the hack I did for IR3. So, or just to phrase the idea quickly, it's um, that you copy back the uniform values to their or original position if you had a life range split within the branch. Within the then, and there's, the then branch. Yeah, and there's some um, theory behind it that it's always possible. Um, yeah, but we can, can also discuss that a bit later, I think, and continue on the algorithm. OK. Yeah, for us, unfortunately, we don't have a clean split between SGPO and VGPO unless we went out of our way to artificially create one. Yeah, um, so you you would probably need to split liveness into two bits, which you probably already do, I imagine. Like, um, whether something is live uh, in the active lanes versus whether it's only live in the inactive lanes. Um, and then um, keep, and then, but the, the problem with is, is that if something is live with only the inactive lanes, uh, multiple things can be sharing the same register. So uh, things get a bit hairy. Yeah. Um, and the other thing is that we can have even logical things that still interfere in the physical control flow graph because we don't have, because of the crazy striding stuff that we do. If you have, say, a 32-bit thing and a 16-bit thing, um, they may actually have different sets of channels overlapping. Right. So then, in that case, the, um, sort of physical. I, I guess what you have materials. to do is is somehow keep track of at each point uh, for each vec eight, like what the channel stride is, um, whether it's not being used by anything. It is being used by an inactive thing, and the channel stride is X, and you may only use the X for active things, or so it's, I've, it's yeah, live. I, I've gone up, so figuring out the liveness isn't too bad, and I've, I've gone about like 
some approaches where we keep track of strides and we try to match similarly strided things on top of each other. And it works for the purposes of interference. But when I'm thinking about how to deal with like fee node resolution and where do you place the fee nodes, what happens if you move one of those things? Uh, I don't have an, I don't have a good idea how to do that yet. Um, um, the fact yeah. that most GPUs have vGPRs that cannot interfere across channels really, really helps with that problem. Um, yeah, and then you can add a few hacks for the remaining scenarios like uh, subgroup operations where you do have that, but um, the linear, the linear, linear GPR is... example sort of assumes like a, a uniform register file if you're just you have available registers and you're doling them out but does that work when you have sgprs and vgprs are those just two sets of registers how does that work for like half floats versus doubles um so for sgprs and vgprs it's very simple you just keep track of the sgpr pressure and the vgpr pressure um they're just two separate register files and um it's and you can pretty easily extend this so uh, instead of a single available set, you have like a available set per register file. Um, that's actually the easy part. The versus the doubles thing and and whatnot. That's where library splitting comes in, um, which is the next part of the yeah. talk. Yeah. So there's a clear distinction. So doubles are basically vector registers, uh, at least for um, Radian, because they just occupy two registers. Um, for half loads, um, that's a bit more tricky because they occupy half a register. And then is the question, what about the other half? Do we pretend that it's actually that it needs the full register, or do we want to reuse that for something else? Um, and yeah, we we basically wrote a hack on top of our register allocator to handle that, but. Um, the, different idea would be to just use it per byte um, your register file or there's different solutions so in the end um yeah that's i think that's more an implementation detail than actually um something affecting the general idea or something yeah um we can have a look at the uh, what comes next. So dominance, we already talked about that. Um, basically in source code order in an SSA, you have dominance properties satisfied. Um, and here we see that you can get these two kill flags on the, in the then um, branch lag and also in the else branch lag. I think in this one it's used in a loop so it doesn't even have a kill flag. Um, at all, which is kind of what I was mentioning. No, then you would have no kill flag in the then branch either. Ah, uh, um, because the, on the right, yeah, hand, yeah on, in the else. The so else I was trying to mention the two, I was trying to, um, I think with this one, I was going for the two scenarios of like, it can have a kill flag or it can just be killed at the end of the loop. Yeah, either way. Um, with the, yeah. Um, and then um, I went over the proof of correctness of this like dominance order thing uh, pretty quickly. So if anyone has any questions, and, and this is kind of the key part of like why it's called tree scan, like why this like works at all um, and doesn't blow up in your face. Um, so, but, so if anyone has any questions about that, about like why it's uh, correct and why we get, why when we visit the beginning of the block, everything is already in a separate register and already visited. Um, yeah, I think it's, so the key point to take away is that at the beginning of each block, you iterate all life in uh, variables and fill your register file with um, where the variables are already are. And there's only two ways how you you can have um, uh, incoming variables in your register file at the beginning of the block. And that's either they are live in, that means they are live out at the 
the immediate um, dominator or they are from a fee node. So it's only these two options and the live ins already have a register and that's the same register no matter from which path the control flow comes and then there's the fee nodes and these variables can can be in different registers depending on the control flow graph, uh, depending on the con control the path takes. So, um, oh, and one thing I think I forgot to mention, I'm just thinking about this now. The reason, uh, so this algorithm, actually, we didn't even treat fee nodes as special at all in here, um, and it still works. And the reason why is that we treat fee nodes, you have to treat fee nodes as special in the Linus analysis pass. Um, because you have to treat phenome sources again as being read at the end of the predecessor block. Um, and then they sort of kill, uh, or they can anyways, kill the, the, that value. Um, and you have to be a bit careful about that. Um. Yeah, so what happens is that you actually just pick any free register for your phenomes and um, then hope that your sources, the sources of the fee node have the same register. That means that you um, get away without any copying of registers. It's just, um, yeah, then it's already there in the correct register. Or uh, if you're not so lucky, then your sources of the fee node have a different register than the destination. And this means you have to implement a copy from one register to the other register in the predecessor uh, or yeah. along the edge um, to the from the predecessor um, block. Oh, and, and one, uh, one thing I forgot to mention, um, the fee nodes are not special at all in this, but um, once you start to do uh, live variance splitting, then fee nodes do have to become special because um, they do become special because you don't insert uh, parallel copies. You can't insert parallel copies before them. They have to stay at the beginning. And you kind of have to allocate them all in parallel. So you can do basically the same uh, shuffle code, but then the shuffles are basically free. Not really free because you might have to insert more copies for the fees, but you basically just ignore it. And then at the very end, you have uh, the initial state of the register file, including all of the fee nodes and all of the live ins, and then you just go and assign uh, the, your, the, the destinations for fee nodes um, all at once. Um, are there questions about this part? I hope we didn't explain it too confusing. <laughs> yeah. Did we drop or no? <laughs> <laughs> okay, that sounds like hopefully I like mean, nobody understood. Either, <laughs> either everyone understood everything or no one understood anything, and it's usually the second one. Um. Okay, you really have to tell if 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 that's unclear. Um, yeah, because there's no I can't we can't really read the room, so there's no way to like. So say, look and see if everyone is totally lost. I'm still good. <laughs> cool. Um, so here's an, then we had this example about um, the fee nodes. Um, yeah. This was with swapping. So uh, Connor said that fee nodes happen in parallel. This does not mean that you have to allocate the registers in parallel. You can just pick one by one. Um, yeah, keep in mind that life range splits there, if, if these need to happen, then they are a bit more complicated. But um, the the idea of how the fee node is executed, so to speak, is that they happen in parallel. So if you assign them the registers, like in this example, there you can see that E1 gets register 0, and the C gets R1. and this is, um, like already kind of said in the presentation, it's fine for the then branch because you can see on both fee nodes that from the if, they also, uh, A comes from R0 and D comes from R1. So there's no copy needed. The incoming value is already in the correct register. 
but coming from the L side, the, the E0 value resides in R1 and the A value resides in R0. So they are in the wrong red registers and need to be copied to, to the destination of the fee. And this has to happen in parallel because all the fee nodes are basically executed in parallel or the values are read in parallel. So in this case, we have to copy R1 to R0 and R0 to R1, and this needs a swap. Yeah, and I think uh, the reason I chose this example is that if you like work at it with paper and pencil, you can kind of see um, you can kind of see that it's actually impossible to allocate this program without swaps uh, using only two registers. So this whole like fee nodes execute in parallel is not just like a thing we made up. It's um, kind of what makes the whole thing possible in a way. And uh, let me tell you, so much it actually happens in practice. I don't know why, but some people like to program like that. So it really occurs in, in practical shaders. <laughs> And, um, but also this can happen on accident. So the big difference between SSA-based register location and the classical register location is that you don't really know in advance, um, yeah, which, which um, variables should go into the same register. So in the classical register location approach, there is like, um, the E1 would be the same variable written in the then and in the else branch, and C would be the same variable and not three different ones. So um, it's clear that they kind of must get the same register. On SSA-based register allocation, you don't know that, and your register allocator just has to try to give them the same register, but um, if you want to make this perfectly, you are definitely in an uh, NP hard terrain. And um, if you do that heuristically, you might end up with just bad luck and uh, need to insert swaps and a, a few copies more. So um, if you have a swap instruction in your architecture, that's cool. And if you don't, then well, <laughs> sorry. You, you basically end up with, um, if you only swap two instructions, that's the same amount as you need if you have an extra register, right? Then you also need three instructions. Yeah. Um, on, if you have chains of swap uh, or um, cycles, then an yeah. extra register would, would be good. I mean, you can, it, depends on how advanced you make the register locator, you can check if there's a free register available and hand this over and try to use that to, yeah. to resolve these cycles. Um, and this brings us to the resolving of the fee nodes. Yeah, so that, this slide was more of a, um, uh, uh, rather than examples, like how to do it uh, in general. And I really sp sped over this because I thought we would run out of time, even though we actually didn't we kind of wound up early. So here is a place that if anyone wants to know like more about the details of the algorithm, um, they can ask away. Um, it's again, very similar to the, like uh, from SSA and NER. I wonder if this is actually also an NP hard problem, but you always have this very short uh, number of very low number of um, I don't think copies. it's I think the simple version is an NP complete like I think you can prove that the version in that paper gives you the minimum number of copies but is this linear linear time yeah yeah the algorithm in the, in the Boston Hill paper yeah, true um, I think that this part is in the hard part but um, the funny thing is that in practice um, this algorithm um, can become really complicated uh, because Right now, I'm just talking about the simple case, but um, in the more complicated case, where you have different kinds of registers and whatnot, um, oops, <laughs> it turns out to be a good idea to um, just have a parallel copy instruction that can basically copy anything to anything, 
And that simplifies a bunch of other parts of the compiler. And then you can put all the complexities about like which instruction do I use, um, which weird swizzle do I use, and so on um, into this pass. And you can use it for fee nodes. I think later I mentioned you can use it for splits and collects. Um, and the parallel copies you create with live brain splitting. So it's really versatile um, and allows you to put all of those fiddly like copy details into yeah. one pass. So, but the, the general idea is that you have a bunch of copies that need to happen in parallel in, in the semantics. And you try to find a sequence of instructions which has the exact same semantics as if it happens in parallel. So yeah, um, you can yeah quickly think about that. It's uh, fairly straightforward that you have to um, have to follow an order how to copy one register to the other so that you never overwrite something that you still need. So. That's the idea. And you might end up with a cycle at the end or with multiple cycles. And then these cycles are a series of swap instructions or XORs. Um, we also have the statement here that you need to consider affinities. Um, that is, uh, that I think we just, touched on that before. Yeah, right? we, we already touched on that. So it, it's, it's best if you avoid the, if you avoid that the fees, if the fee destination is a different register than the sources, then you don't need a copy at all because the value already is in the correct register. So um, that's all this affinity stuff about. And you can try to make it basically infinitely smart in your register locator to, um, <laughs> to try to always match the, the fee sources with the destination but um, it will still not always work out. Um, so yeah, in, in a traditional graph coloring register allocator, the hill you die on, the thing that kind of always sucks is you just pick the wrong like allocation order, and then you just run out of registers. Um, and then that always winds up being a problem, and you have tons of heuristics to sort of tune that and so on. Um, yeah. And you try and fix that and try to do live brain splitting, and then here, um, the problem becomes, oh my god, we're inserting too many copies. Why? Yeah, um, I, I just, um, um, on Monday, I created a merge request that does tune the affinities on the echo slightly. And I think it removes like 2% um, of all copy instructions. Or, um, yeah, that's. Um, very sensitive in the register locator how you handle affinities and this kind of stuff. It uh, has a really big impact on, on the final outcome. Um, yeah, that brings us to live range splitting. Live range splitting basically is the solution to all constraints, all assumptions. It's, it resolves all assumptions that were taken in the previous papers about SSI-based register location, where they assume that every variable has a size of one. So, um, and there's no pre-coloring and no whatsoever, and every instruction can use the same registers and um, yeah. uh, stuff like that. And the life range splitting basically uh, helps to resolve all these is issues, I think yeah. all. So if you have pre-coloring, you can resolve that with live range splits. Uh, if you have vector uh, vectors, you can resolve it with that. So yeah, it's, it's the hammer to solve, <laughs> to, to make it fit. <laughs> um, yeah, it's the hammer we have, and then everything kind of looks like a nail. Um, and uh, I, I, this was also one of the main reasons I wanted to do this talk, because again, if uh, someone asks, like, well, is there an overview on how live range splitting works in ACO and IR3? Again, the answer is no. So all the papers on SSA-based register allocation just kind of hand wave their way around this and say stuff like, just insert a parallel copy instruction for every live value in between every instruction, and then the graph is portal again. And you're like, 
but <laughs> that would kill performance. Yeah, I think there's actually, I only remember one paper which does on a life range splitting algorithm. That's the puzzle solving uh, paper from uh, Fernando Pereira. And he assumes that every vector is a power of two in size and that simplifies stuff a lot. It, it simplifies stuff so much that we just cannot use it. Um, <laughs> Uh, if you, as soon as you have um, VEX3 or you have unaligned or both um, vectors, then it all falls apart and you you have to figure, like... It's probably empty hard as soon as you add those in. Yeah. So the, how much the minimum splitting problem? I mean, I, I hope the the example it's more or less clear that you might end up in a situation where there's the register where there is enough space in the register file but not for your variable not contiguous <laughs> yeah not contiguous it's scattered and you have to make space uh, that is contiguous so, so yeah it's like um it's like the fragmentation in like a memory allocator or something like that, um, except that here we have the tools to actually uh, move things around and uh, fix it, the fragmentation kind of. Yeah, and in, in this example here, we just move um, the one register away and then we have enough space, but um, there is this worst case scenario and I only want to mention it briefly here. Um, here in this example, we just have one free register at the beginning, one at the end, and in between we have only web two, so we cannot move a single variable away to make space. We would actually have to move every single variable that is in the register file. Um, and just for how how probable is this even? And I can tell you that in ECHO, this happens uh, exactly once in the whole CTS that <laughs> a bit tries to force this scenario by loading a bunch of Wix3, I think. Like the whole register file is full of that. <laughs> And um, that's the only situation where we ever needed that. And to fix our broken CTS test, um, Rees implemented um, yeah, a small algorithm that just moves every variable to the beginning to, uh, of the register file. But that, that's really uh, such a worst case scenario, you will likely never encounter this in any real world application yeah. ever um but it, uh, go ahead i'll let you finish what you're saying then i have two questions sure yeah um what were you gonna say uh yeah just that this likely never happened I, did i want to add more i don't i don't think so okay it was done <laughs> okay um so first question have you can have you experimented with um, slightly, artificially slightly decreasing the size of your register file to make this less likely? Um, to make it less likely, you mean like overestimating the number of variables we need? Yeah, by like one register or something to give you just um, a So ECHO bit. does kind of do that where, well, it does it on the fly. So like rather when, um, when the, uh, they they have a sort of clever recursive algorithm that tries to use less moves, and when that fails, rather than doing this, shuffle everything, um, they just uh, bump up the size of the register file because yeah. of the whole dynamic register sharing thing. So first, does, we... that, does that have any interaction with the occupancy cliff edges? Because um, you know, it seems to me that there's no point trying to allocate into sixty two registers because sixty four gives you the same occupancy. So um, you would kind of round up anyway, wouldn't you? Um, yeah, I mean, you like if you're near the edge, like um, then yeah, you just have to suck it up and just uh, move everything because this whole point yeah. of this like SSA based register allocation is that you don't have to spill. Um, and but like fortunately, so if, if you 
it is kind of unfortunate if you're on the edge and then you just kind of um, you have to move up. But yeah, so in 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 um, ACO and IR3, the way it works is that um, we calculate the register pressure, and then from the register pressure, we calculate um, the demand that's possible, assuming that we just allocate everything as tightly as possible. And then from that, we go and calculate the real register pressure. So we do do this kind of thing you mentioned where like, um, if we can bump up the, red, the demand by a few extra registers to have the same occupancy, then um, we will do that. So um, this case doesn't come up unless your register pressure happens to be exactly at that limit usually it would be interesting to figure if you can calculate a minimum number of extra registers you need to never get into this situation or if this is possible i doubt i think you this will be either too large to be feasible or um or it just doesn't work out but uh, another thing to note is that you in like in the in normal real world applications you always have enough single scalar um, variables next to each other that you can always like move um, these scalar scalar variables into empty slots and have space so the typical the i say the practical worst case is that you have to move size of your vector variables yeah. that's that's what happens in practice and the other thing to note is that um most most of the time in the back end you are immediately creating a vector when um you have a when you need to let's say have a texture instruction you just create a vector immediately before it and then in a load instruction you um, split the, the vector immediately after in instruction selection typically um, and then um, if and then if you keep that around if you keep that split vector and create vector around then the amount of time when there's a vector register in the file is very very small um, it's the old, this only really becomes a problem when your pre RA scheduler moves things around or when you optimize like a, a split and then collect into a single into the original thing, um, which I think ACO does that for other reasons, which is maybe why you ran into this problem in the first place. Um, it kind of sucks because, like, uh, if you if your pre RA scheduler does that, and if you don't have this like optimization of like detecting a split and then a collect and then just returning the original, but um, the original vector, then you're never going to have more than like one or two live vectors at the same time, and then you like pretty much never run into this in practice. But there's no way, in theory, to to like go through your entire allocator and like your entire backend and just prove that this will never happen. Um, yeah, yeah I, it's, it's I, I, your schedule it has some um, can, can create some entertaining shaders sometimes. Like yeah. create the payloads for 16 texture instructions and then fire the texture instructions. Yeah, so that's exactly the scenario where this kind of becomes an issue. <laughs> um, so the other question that I was going to ask is, have you considered, um, am I still here? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. Okay, sorry. I just, I my display blanked and so I don't know what happened. Um, have you considered if you hit this scenario, instead just like move one, just move the first component of V0 out of the way. Oh, and then oh we collect it back later. <laughs> I actually started out the IR3 register allocator trying, assuming that I would do this. And then it became a giant mess. Um, because I I I started around the time I started it, Riz was implementing this special case, and I was like, hmm. I can just avoid it, right? Um, the problem is that the data structure then becomes way, way more complicated because um, consider that us uh, instructions can have multiple vector sources, and then those sources all have to be aligned. So, like um, your I don't know texture instruction or like a 
store in, uh, a load instruction, a store instruction that takes both a descriptor and a vector value, for example, on AMD or something like that. Um, so you still kind of have this problem because um, let's say you coalesce the first uh, source and then yay, you can just move whatever components, you don't have to care about this. But then once you've coalesced it, it's there and you can't. <laughs> you can't break it up again in order to coalesce the second source. Um, so you, and when you allocate the destination, you also can't uncoalesce those sources. So uh, again, it's this case where like, um, you in theory don't need the backup, but how in the hell are you, how the hell are you gonna actually prove that like whatever heuristic you came up with like actually does this successfully? <laughs> Yeah, because um, you, you have, at least on our hardware, you have potentially three vectors that all have to be vectors at the time the instruction executes, because some sense can yeah. have two vector sources and a vector destination. So yeah, I, I okay, that, that makes sense. I was just, like, when I was looking at this, I was like, okay, there's an obvious solution to this. I'm sure there's a reason they're not doing this. <laughs> what it is. I tried, I tried real hard. Yeah. <laughs> We also discussed this like several times and gave up on it. <laughs> but it's so unlike, or it's so rare that I think it's not really worth the the time that you spend on it to improve this one edge case that actually never happens. So you implement this kind of shitty algorithm, and then at least you sleep soundly at night that your register allocator won't fall apart. Um, <laughs> and you pass the CTS. And you pass the CTS. <laughs> So um, the code you compile, uh, presumably it never has calls in. It never has calls. Um, so calls, well, uh, we haven't implemented call, shader calls yet, but that that's basically the same sort of shenanigans. Uh, yeah, that's what I was thinking, yeah. So when Daniel mentioned never having preloaded, never having um, pre-colored registers, again, this is, this is the solution. This is the hammer for your nail. <laughs> yeah, but with the calls thing, is there a... Um, not, not with the fragmentation thing you're talking about here with the vectors, but with the call thing, uh, is there some scope to kind of bias your register allocation to try and avoid the situation happening and avoid... Yeah, so it's similar are, to the affinities, the three affinities probably. Yeah. yeah. We, we also use some kind of affinities for, for our vec, uh, VEC3, VEC4 and such instructions. So if we know that we will use these components later in a vector, we already try when, assign, when assigning the, the register for the, for the variables, we already try to align them next to each other so that we don't get overhead when we are, when we are at the actual create vector um, oh. instruction. And something similar would be done if you want to, uh, if you want uh, like, um, um, call arguments uh, in specific registers that you already try to use these register when in the um, uh, destination is written. So um, yeah, that's that's part of the heuristic to to improve the, or to have less copies than in general. Like yeah, yeah. yeah. And another thing to note is that it, um, it's actually impossible or it can become impossible if you want to have fixed registers that don't start at the beginning. Um, because uh, if it doesn't start at the beginning, like if you try to fix R1, R2, and R3, well, what if the rest of your register file, what if the rest of the live values happen to be vec twos? And then there's like one hole at the beginning and one hole at the end, and then you just can't move it. <laughs> so you really can't yeah. allocate it without spilling. Um, so you have to be kind of careful when with dealing with uh, fixed registers. So yep. I think for us, we have fixed registers at the beginning and we have fixed registers at the end, but the live ranges of the two never overlap. Yeah, but the at the end is like uh, is that is that at the um, send message at the end? So there, there's a requirement that the last message that leaves the EU has to be in high registers, or else there's a way. Yeah, I think that's pretty easy. Like we actually have to do something very similar in IR3 because we have these shader chaining thing where. Um, kind of like on AMD, uh, the vertex shader and the
escalation control shader are the same thing, but they're actually in separate binaries. The hardware has a magic instruction that one chains to the other, and then um, there's like an ABI in between them. So like the some special magic control registers have to be in like R0, and then this one has to be in R, R1. But that's not hard to handle because First of all, you do the biasing thing that we were talking about of like trying to allocate it in this register at the definition. And then at the very end, well, the only thing that's live is your register. So you can just move it around however you want. Um, and so you can, if, if, it, if you get to that last message and then it just happens to be um, that it got assigned to the wrong register, well, you can just move it. Um, right, that yeah. makes sense. Yeah. If your register file is empty, then this isn't a problem. Um, we can get to the, the control flow handling uh, with life range splits. That is, um, what happens if a variable gets split on one path of the control flow and not on another one? So that means that in this example, v1, after um, after executing both branch legs is when coming from the then branch is in, in a different register than coming from the else branch. And this is kind of tricky um, because yeah, you have to repair that. So sorry for the slide. Um, let's stick with this one. So um, I think it's obvious that after the, the branch, you want V1 again to be in the same register, no matter from which, um, which path the control flow took. So um, what ACO in this case does is create a new fee node and uh, assign it, remove it from the live ins because it's in this case not really a live in variable with one fixed register anymore, but it's uh, like two different values coming from two different uh, passes. So we create a fee node and this fee node gets a register assigned, whatever is available. We try to give it like uh, either R1 or R2 in this case to match at least one of the edges and only have a copy on the other. So one solution is that you insert a copy in the else side to also move it to R2 or in, in the then branch, like you can just move it back to R1. So, but either of the two have to happen. Um, and the, the thing I was mentioning to Daniel is that actually, um, it, so, there are there are these two approaches that you either um, add you either rename all the SSA values and like keep SSA or you have the uses of your value have different register than the definition and insert uh, these copies with just physical registers, uh, which is what IR three does. But even if you do that, you can't just insert a copy at the end uh, of the else branch in this example. Like it just doesn't work um, because and I have like a whole long comment an IR3 explaining this. Um, but that uh, copy has to happen in parallel with copies for fee nodes, because fee nodes, again, the sources are considered to be live. So we need to swap a fee node source. And um, uh, so if we want to say, let's move, let's say we, we want to move R2 back to R1 at the end of the if here. Um, then there might be something else live in, in R1. R1 that then needs to be moved to R2 because we happen to put the pheno there. Um, and then that has to happen in parallel. So what you'd have to do is create a pheno with like physical arguments and a physical destination or what do what ECO does and just uh, keep SSA alive. So it's a bit tricky. Um, you can't just insert copy copies blindly. <laughs> Yeah, um, so the, the algorithm ECHO does is it, in principle is just a very straightforward SSA repairing algorithm. Uh, what IR3 does is just re basically repair the register and uh, IR3 just um, remembers the register and ECHO 
yeah, cr creates actual renames for the SSA values and repairs the SSA. Uh, both have the same result and are in, in principle the same idea. It's uh, just the question whether you want um, correct SSA after the register allocation or if you don't care anymore about SSA um, after register allocation. So I think that's that's it so far about oh, the... Do we want to go into more detail on the library splitting and the, uh, the whole loops versus ifs question? Um, ah, yeah. So we didn't really... Here we only used a branch as an example, but it can also happen that you got a live range split. Do we have... We have an extra... Oh, oh yeah, yeah, we have this extra slide on live range split. Yeah. Um, it can happen that you have the live range split in a loop. So what happens then, Connor? <laughs> um, yeah, so let's go back. Wait, let's go back to this slide. Um, and let's say that like instead of an if else there, we have like a loop. We have a while loop, and the R1 gets moved to R2 uh, in some like live range split in the middle of a loop. Um, so what ACO does. Well, do you want to talk about what ACO used to do versus what it does now? No, <laughs> I think. Um, so it, with it, within an if, you can just create fee nodes on the fly, kind of because once you visit a block, you visited, you've already visited all of its predecessors, um, and then you know what it got renamed to. But when you visit the uh, header block of the loop, you might not have visited a some of the predecessors before. Um, so you sort of have to speculatively create fee nodes, or at least record somehow. Like, uh, so pick pick a register based on uh, the things that were already visited. Record, oh, these are the live registers at the beginning of this block, and then do the entire thing. And then once you get to the end of the loop, you compare like what are the registers now with what were the registers at the beginning. And then either insert fee nodes or just insert those like physical fee nodes. And if you insert real fee nodes like an echo, then you have to go back through the entire loop and rewrite everything using that value back to the, the fee node. Yeah, but let's just assume that we we just insert the, um, the physical fee nodes or whatever at the beginning of the loop. Um, keep in mind that the register is already um, is already fixed. Like when you first visited the loop and handled the life in values at the loop header, then every life in already has uh, has a register. So when you do a life range split in the loop, then it's clear that the the in that the fee node has this original register, and you only change um, the, the sources of the fee. You cannot then pick a different register for your for your variable. It's, after you visit the loop. Yeah, after you visited the loop, it, it will stay like it, it must go back to the original register. That, your life range split will be copied back by inserting the fee node at the beginning of the header. But then it, it actually turns into a copy um, at the end of the loop after when you lower fee nodes. So, um, yeah, I hope this wasn't too, too complex now. What is this? Oh, yeah, but talking about the details of how, uh, the, how you do live range splitting. Um, so, uh, I uh, lost yeah. over that, but um, so in the original algorithm, I pro we processed the uses and then processed the destination, and they were kind of separate um, in separate loops, and we didn't have to intermix them. But as soon as we get to live rate splitting, that's no longer the case, and things are no longer so simple um, because they kind of now interact with each other. Um, so you need to consider that there are three types of values that you care about. Um, first, uses that are killed, uh, and live through values, which includes uh, uses which are not killed, which are basically treated the same as things that happen to be live through the instruction from the point of view of library splitting. 
uh, and then definitions. So uh, the problem is, uh, and, and one of the one way to sort of describe it in the puzzle allocation paper um, that Daniel mentioned is you can imagine a two by n puzzle board where the width of the puzzle board is uh, two and the height is the size of your register file. Uh, killed uses can only go on the left because um, they end in the middle, and you're in, so the, the 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 width two represents the state of the register file beforehand, and then the, the left hand side represents the state of the register file before your instruction. The right hand side represents the state of the register file after your instruction, um, and then killed uses can only go on the left, and you have to fill all of them in. Definitions only go on the right because they're only live after the instruction, uh, and you have to fill those in. And then live through values are live both before and after the instruction. So, and they have to be at the same value. You can't uh, shuffle them during the instruction. So they have to be the same. And then you basically place uh, these pieces on this puzzle board, and you want to find a solution to this puzzle which minimizes the number of um, killed uses in live through which differ from what they were before the instruction. Um, and then uh, when you, after you solve this puzzle, then you, uh, for everything that was different, for every killed use in live through that's different, you go and insert a parallel copy. And then those all have to happen at once because you basically decided the solution for your thing all at once and then it has to be the, the live values are live here, and then they're there. But we all decided how they were. You have to kind of have decide where to put them at once, and then you insert this parallel copy instruction, and then the whole transfer graph thing takes care of actually turning it into hardware instructions. Yeah, it sounded probably more complicated than it actually is. But for for in short, it's when you do the the live range splitting and you move variables around, you have to keep in mind that this might be an operand that is just killed, or it might be uh, a definition, a, a second definition of your um, instruction. And uh, you have to take care a bit where you can move it if, uh, is, if it really already exists. And at the point when you do the live range split or um, or if there's something else in the yeah. way, stuff like that. So I think in IR3, we basically only support one definition per register file at the moment. And then uh, the way it works is we keep oh, yeah, the state this. of the register file beforehand. You have the split instruction that has multiple definitions. Oh, but ours doesn't, remember, because it, <laughs> the whole register coalescing thing. Um, I really wish it had multiple destinations. It would have made everything so much easier, but it does not. Um, so uh, you, um, we keep the state of the register file beforehand, and, all, and also a split instruction is trivial because you can just always assign it to the same thing. Yeah. Um, and anyways, so uh, you, um, because we only support destination, we just look at the register file before the instruction. And then we shuffle things around to make space for the destination. Um, record everything, insert our parallel copy instruction, and then allocate our destination to the, the hole that we basically made in that register file. But that kind of doesn't work if there's multiple destinations, um, because you kind of need to make multiple holes and remember where the previous hole was so that you don't kind of fill it again, or at least move it around. And I think ACO has a more complicated uh, Thing that can, in theory, handle multiple destinations, yeah. where you constantly switch well, back and forth to the state before and after the instruction. But we 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 block the register file to not move certain registers anymore. Anyways, um, yeah, I, I don't really dare to ask if there are questions about this topic. <laughs> this is the one of the nastier parts of a uh, real world. Um, real-world SSA-based allocator. Ah, I wanted to, to talk with you about um, transitioning a existing classic register allocator to um, this SSA-based style without actually using SSA. So 
Um, but first, let me ask if there are question ab questions about this live range splitting stuff. I was wondering if there's any scope for, um, in some cases, uh, just going back and changing the original allocation of that variable. But it sounds like yeah, it, so that would be kind of rewinding and going going a bit sort of taking the age of the universe. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is where it becomes empty hard real quick because yeah. Yeah, that's basically like a backtracking kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, this is called um, recoloring. Um, there is there is a paper about doing that um, on on graph uh, in a graph based fashion afterwards, doing recoloring and they just limit the recursion depth to not make it immediately um, taking exponential time, mm. but uh, that's definitely like yeah that's you directly hit into the NP hardness of, of the register location when you try that. In ACO, we currently are experimenting with some um, very simple um, recoloring approach by walking once, af like after the register location, walking once over the program and just uh, checking if the, the parallel copy can be coalesced with the original uh, definition like instead of uh, making one definition and then immediately copying it away just directly right to the to the second uh, one um, and can yeah. you do that in a kind of tree scanning kind of way or does it need more traditional likeness analysis and that sort of thing um, you can do some limited amount of it or, but uh, the, the problem is in general to so in order to do that, uh, to move the definition um, in the parallel copy, you need to make sure that everything in between the definition and parallel copy uh, doesn't interfere with it. Um, and in general, I think that bit requires building up an interference graph, which is exactly the thing we kind of wanted to avoid with the whole scanning approach. Mm. Yeah. So if you don't do it recursively, then you are limited to very few cases where it actually works that the register was already free but if you want to do it extensively you are immediately in the np hard graph coloring situation yeah so all all register allocators have some kind of like problem where it winds stuff winds up blowing up and you're like oh if only it could have done this um and then this is kind of the area where it happens with SSA-based allocators. Um, and uh, you can, I mean, there, there are so many different ways where you can be like, oh, but if only it did this, then, and yeah. then quickly run to and be hard. Yeah, we call this the RA lottery in ACO. <laughs> I think every, every, has, every driver has Every register allocator has an RA lottery. <laughs> um, <laughs> I guess your um, point at the start of your talk yesterday was that uh, on a GPU where um, spills are really expensive, it's um, it's worth doing something that might have extra copies just to get rid of all the spills. Yeah, that's the theory at least. Yeah, yeah. that's exactly what we do. So Echo da does um, spilling before the register allocation, even before scheduling, um, so that the, the spill decisions can be scheduled as well. Uh, that's part of the idea and it um, avoids it doesn't even call the spilling pass if we know that the that we have enough registers for the program and um, so spilling happens in echo basically in one in a thousand shaders only so we really broadly avoid spilling um, at all if if we if we can avoid it and only if the program already like without scheduling needs too many registers, then we only consider spelling as an option. Mm, we are, however, experimenting with uh, trying to spill some stuff if it can give us uh, a bigger uh, number of waves for the shader. Yeah. Um, so if, if you can reduce your register usage by a couple of registers and that gives you uh, more parallelism, then it might be worth it. 
I think yeah. uh, Daniel had some promising patches for that. Yeah, we we have we need more benchmarking to see if that actually helps. Mm. Where, where is that patch, by the way? Um, because uh, I, I'd be interested to take a look at that. Yeah, I can. I, I think I have that somewhere. I, I will paste it to you afterwards. Um, okay, thank you. Um, yeah, is there more questions about it? Otherwise, I think we are, don't have too much time anymore. So I would like to get into the transition of the. So what else go doing uh, spilling ahead of time? Is that uh, how IR three works as well? Does it do spilling ahead of RA? Yes, it also does spilling, and it is using the exact same paper that ACO is using. Um, we didn't have any time at all to go over the spilling algorithm. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if we can make it and vaporize that out of thin air, but actually um, the spilling is better because there is a real paper that explains uh, how the spilling happens. Um, so it's less a less bad situation than, for example, live range splitting, where there's just nothing. Um, there's just our presentation as far as we know, um, and a bunch of kind of half-baked ideas in papers. Um, yeah, so, yeah we really, do it ahead of time. I would really, really like to do it ahead of time for our stuff because um, the, when you do it post-RA or mid-RA, I guess, uh, yeah. due to all of our crazy striding stuff, there's a bunch of cases where you have to like unspill and then we spill just to get at weirdly strided things. Um, but if we did pre RA spilling and we were a little bit more judicious about where we picked our spills, um, yeah. we could almost always spill logical values instead of physical values. And that would allow us to take much better instruction advantage of the spill fill instructions that we have available to us. Um, I I think so. Um, the problem with that is that on, on Intel, like um, because you have these like uh, values that are live, and then values that are sort of live, the values that are sort of live don't um, are can share the same register, and they can share a register with the actually live values. That means that you don't have that same strict. Um, you don't have that like condition, which kind of guarantees that allocation is always going to succeed. I think I we can get there if we have the right interference model. It's just a matter of how absurdly painful it's going to end up being. I think so. I think you need some sort of approximation. Um, the one we were talking about is just like in uniform flow, control flow, you can ignore all this, but then in each, you divvy up uh, each of the regions the outermost like non-uniform regions, and then you figure out like, okay, how many 16-bit values are there? How many 32-bit values do you need? How many scalar values do you need? And then just add them up. Yeah, the maximum um, of each. And then divvy it, uh, kind of partition it statically between them. Yeah, um, I mean, we could still compute a, a, a pressure in terms of bytes where we keep track of all of the sort of live, I don't know what you would call them, but the, the sort of ephemeral stuff that's live in other channels that are disabled as also being contributing to that number of bytes or something. I, I think but then the, 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 the problem is that they can overlap. So you will also overestimate things. Um, and I think we just have to eat that. <laughs> like, <laughs> there's some amount of overestimating that we're just going to have to suck it up and eat. Um, yeah, so either you can overestimate it by like statically partitioning the file and just like um, assuming that you don't. The, the case where you would overestimate there is where you have like a lot of 16 bit values live, and then later you have a lot of 32 bit values live. Uh, and that kind of overestimates it in that case, but then at least allows you to overlap um, these ephemeral registers. Um, versus that case is basically the same as. Uh, as your overestimates thing, what you just said basically overestimates things in the same way that your current register allocator overestimates things. Um, uh, let me quickly um, go over the idea of transitioning an existing classic register allocator to this SSA based approach. So the this idea. Um, uh, 
is based on the fact that if you lower um, SSA or if you um, deconstruct SSA, your register pressure does not yet change as long as you insert parallel copies instead of a sequence of copies. So in, um, in, well, and, and by, by just by just translating out of SSA and inserting parallel copies at the control flow edges, um, if you have no critical edges, at least, I think it doesn't work even if you have critical edges. So yeah, by just inserting the parallel copies at the control flow edges, you don't change your um, register pressure. So the assumptions that just with getting away with life range splitting instead of um, spilling, uh, still holds the the and if you if you think about the actually when I was coding this up in IR3 I even noticed this that the handling for live range splits and the handling for phi nodes um or so the, yeah the handling for live range like re-emerging live range splits and the handling for phi nodes is actually surprisingly very similar um because yeah you you um, in both cases, you have to kind of like re uh, and insert these copies along the edges. Um, and so you could, in theory, get rid of the fee nodes and just use your live range splitting code. Yeah. And so the idea would be to um, uh, deconstruct SSA, uh, but keep the parallel copies in place and then add life range splitting um, to your register allocator. Your register allocator can still keep the ability to, to spill code, but it, um, like you can already implement the logic be behind life range splitting and fixing up the, the life range split splits. And, and then you can transition from there by special casing the, the parallel copies at the end of the blocks because now it becomes important that that you basically handle them as if they are fee nodes in the next block. So instead of already allocating the, the parallel copy definitions when you finish a block, you can um, you can handle the definitions of the parallel copy uh, when when you are actually handling the live ins in in the next block. But uh, yeah, I think there's a path forward to basically smoothly transition from a classic allocator to such SSA-based, uh, to the SSA-based ideas at least, um, without interrupting or completely rewriting the, uh, the register allocator because that's a ton of work and we will start with a lot of bugs and, uh, and then you will have to write a register allocation validator which you should do if you didn't already anyways. Uh. Yeah, so both ICO and IR3 have this like validation pass, which is a really nice thing because um, it catches all of your tricky RA bugs and um, it gives you the, if it didn't fail, it gives you the, the guarantee that your RA is not the source of a bug, um, some like kind of miscompilation or something. Um, and the way it works is basically just by following each definition from its use and making sure that that register kind of gets there um, from the definition all the way to the use without getting clobbered. Um, as uh, at least in IR3's case, we do it as like a data flow analysis. Um, yeah, we also resort to some kind of um, life variable analysis and check that basically um, that all the properties hold and the register file is only used by a single variable during its lifetime. Uh, yeah. Um, I so, think, yeah. Um, on the, you were talking about you know, converting registry allocators. There's actually a really good paper on this. Um, it's called Quality and Speed in Linear Scan Registry Allocation. And I believe it's by some people at Harvard. Um, and it's one of the ones that I dug up when I was working on IBC. And it basically does 
a SSA based linear scan register allocator without actually going into SSA um, by using a lot of the same concepts and kind of inserting D nodes and shuffling stuff around as needed across edges. Um, I can provide uh, does it do swap instructions and stuff like parallel. Does it insert parallel copies? Um, it's not the same. I don't remember if they used a parallel copy or not. I think they may have had to in some cases. Is this the one describing the LVM allocator? No. Because I know LVM does do some live brain splitting, but then they kind of run into the same sort of problems we were describing where like they, um, they try to like backtrack and stuff and then it can kind of blow up in your face. Um, um, split. Anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll post a citation to the paper um, in case anybody's interested. I found it in, uh, to be an interesting read. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I don't have time to scan the paper now, so I'll just keep a tab open. Um, yeah. Um, oh, does anyone talk, want to talk about um, specifically IR3 and it's, uh, yeah, we're, we're, I think we have another 30 minutes or so. Six starts at 35, it's two hours. Just oh, before that, can I just ask about the transitioning thing? Does anyone know of anyone working on um, doing that sort of thing to introduce this kind of register allocation on the LLVM target independent code generator? Uh, I don't know of that, honestly. I think someone might have done it for x86, but... Less based register allocator? Yeah, but LLVM, like, uh, the thing about register allocators is that um, the design of the register, like, the more complex your register allocator becomes, the more the design of the IR becomes tied to the design of the register allocator. And actually, you can remember someone reading, mentioning this on LLVM Dev, that like um, they, the, the design of the IR and the design of the register allocator kind of become intertwined. Um, and it yeah, was that's already an effort to effort to rewrite IR3 to use SSA-based register allocation. I had to change a number of things in the IR. Um, so I imagine that if you were to do that with LVM, there would be, it would be basically rewriting everything. Um, yeah, that's what I was thinking. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite difficult like, to figure out how you would fit it into its existing framework of, in theory, pluggable register allocators, but they all rely on how MIR works and how live, live intervals work. Exactly, yeah. So you, the data structures kind of become intertwined. Um, yeah. It's nice in theory that you can like plug in different register allocators. I don't, I don't really think it works in practice. There's a lot of restrictions on instructions or what you allow in your IR and um, and then how, how your register yeah. allocator um, has to deal with that. I mean, all these restrictions on, on instructions have to be handled by the register allocator. Yeah, so in LVM, you kind of just uh, build up this like register file and describe all the constraints very like mechanically. But with live range splitting, you kind of can't do that because this, the particular constraints impacts the algorithm that you have to use to solve the puzzle, um, so to speak. Um, and so you kind of can't write your live range splitting algorithm without knowing a bit about the structure of the register file. Yeah. Um, so I mean, does that right re result in in a compiler like ACO? That means that if you if you one day wanted to retarget it to something else, like say Intel GPUs, then you would have to sort of half rewrite all that stuff. Yeah, I mean Connor, I think he would have loved to just copy it over, but that <laughs> yeah didn't, work out. didn't really work out. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I, that ties in again to the question I got during the talk of like. Uh, and I think Anhold asked the same question initially when I first mentioned this of like, can can we share this? And like, um, there's a shared infrastructure in LVM, there's a shared register allocator thingy in Mesa, um, but it just becomes so much harder with SSA based register allocation. I, I suggested to Connor that he should just extend the echo IR with IR3 instructions. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> 
Um, yeah. So <laughs> but that, that would basically be rewriting LLVM inside Mesa, right? So that's, that's a bit of that. <laughs> and yeah. run into the same problems of like your live range splitting being heavily dependent on what your register yeah. file looks I like. Can, I can tell that even in ACO, so we have some GPU generations that support a swap instruction and some older GPU generations that don't do that. And also in SGPRs, there's no swap instruction. And this already affects how the register locator tries to um, search for, for available registers and live range splits. Because in, if there is a swap instruction, then it's actually beneficial to reuse the, the, um, like the swapped away position of a variable. Uh, because then with a single instruction, you can just swap two places. But if you don't have a swap instruction, then you want to avoid this case because then you end up with three instructions instead of two if you use any other position. So that th this is just a very small example how your, how your architecture affects the life range splitting algorithm. Um, yeah, and if, if I hadn't accidentally discovered the swap instruction on Qualcomm, I probably would have done um, the light, that like stuff a little differently too. Um, I would have had to do this whole liveness like scanning thing. Um, so uh, you do kind of have to work on your architecture a bit. I think if you want to use this sort of algorithm, like you can. Um, it, it brings a lot of benefits uh, for GPUs. And it makes things so much better, um, and you kind of but you can't just use it with any architecture. It's not as it's not pluggable um, in that sense. Is there a swap instruction on Intel actually? No. <laughs> oh, okay. I, the swap it, lack of a swap instruction is the least of our problems. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of true. Like there are. The, when it comes to th thinking about things like SSA-based register allocation, our GPU architecture is pathological. Um, and the like, there's a lot of problems that we need to solve before we can get there that fall into the category of academic research. Um, the lack of a swap instruction is, I mean, sure, I'd love a swap instruction, but oh boy. Yeah, I kind of wonder when the, the architects add these swap instructions, is it because they're reading these like SSA based register allocation papers? Like I can't imagine any other reason why. Like uh, Swapping data around is a fairly common thing. Um, yeah, but even in LVM, I don't think mode. they have any like optimization. Maybe they have some people somewhere that tries to detect that pattern and turn it into a swap instruction. I mean, but... it's hard to represent a swap instruction in SSA. So it's probably not going to be represented in LLVM directly, but like you could peephole to generate it potentially. Yeah, um, I guess. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. This is a parallel copy. Maybe they just look at CPUs and CPUs have swap instructions. So like this seems like a good idea. I don't know. <laughs> True. If you have SSA with only single definitions, you cannot represent the swap instruction. Yeah, well, it gets folded sure. into the parallel copy in the Fino, doesn't it? Yeah, it's a parallel copy, but that has multiple definitions. Um, well, that's one of the other reasons why I don't know how it would even work on Intel is that we like the way our hardware is set up. It's very clearly separated between source and destination, and I'm not yeah, even, like a swap instruction would have to be a completely different encoding, effectively. And actually, on, on in Qualcomm, the same thing happened, and they did just define a completely different category of instruction, where like you will um, have multiple sources and destinations. Um, I think on AMD, it just writes one of the sources. Yeah. Yeah. So now that we've got, now that with Tiger Lake, we've got the scoreboard-based dependency tracking, swap is probably possible to stick into the hardware. Um, I don't think it would have been possible before without insanity. But yeah, it's again, swap is the least of our problems. So uh, what we discussed about um, Intel earlier today was that um, the idea to basically statically partition the register file 
I think Connor mentioned that already. Uh, yeah, and then handle it as a, a couple of independent register files, um, at least within control flow. Yeah, and then you're gonna have um, you're gonna have these like live values, and then these like um, ephemeral live values, whatever you want to call them. And then you probably want to insert fee nodes for them on loops um, and stuff like that when they're like you know uh, the loop is what's the case where the loop is divergent and um, uh, there can be cases where it's like live in the beginning of the loop but only in inactive lanes because it represents um, the previous iterations that already ended and have yeah. the value waiting for after the loop. But um, so you want to you want to basically construct um, that like if those ephemeral sort of live ranges, and then you probably want to either statically partition or come up with something more clever, and then you want to insert. Um, v nodes and, and copies for those ephemeral edges, the same as normal edges, only you use um, uh, no mass construction when you actually go and like insert the, co the, the copies and the swaps. Um, yeah, so st statically partitioning pot potentially works. The um, problem with this, the partitioning is that, again, like similar to what I mentioned with the problem with, uh, um, with pre-coloring, like if your static partition is kind of scattered, um, then you have problems. So maybe what you want to do is like have a way to change the partitioning kind of where you just use no mask instructions to move everything around um, and keep track of that. Uh, yeah. If you know what I mean? Yeah, we could we could sort of we like. We have we have the no mask instructions, so we can rearrange the partitioning if needed. Um, and, and yeah, and rearrange all of the ephemeral values while you're at it, and then. Um, so you're gonna probably gonna need to do something like that, unless you have a static partitioning and it's like not at all mixed, so that it's like one type and then the other type and then the other type. Um, yeah, and doing the static partitioning for. Um, scalar slash uniform values versus vector values would not be too hard. We just figure out what our scalar register pressure is and put all that stuff at the beginning. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's an overestimation, but I think it's not, it's still it should be a terrible overestimation. Yeah. I, I mean, what's the alternative to spill? As soon as you don't find a register, that's I also guess the alternative is to just assume that the ephemeral values are actually live, which is kind of what the existing allocator does. Um, but that's also and the rest of add, poles, add poles to the file. Yeah, well, so. and but but the problem is that that's not the only case we have to worry about because we have different size values and we can have you know ghost interference. It's called ghost values. I like that better because then they haunt you. And they're kind of alive. <laughs> um, we've we've got ghost values that, um, where depending on your stride, you might land on top of them. Um, we can have like sixteen bit registers with a a two byte stride. We can have sixteen bit registers with a four byte stride, and those can interfere with each other. We can have thirty two bit registers interfering with sixteen bit registers. We can have um, if you have two 32-bit registers where they don't start at the same spot, then you can have the channel, the channel masks not line up. Um, like the number of cases where this can go off the rails is massive. Yeah, so I, I'm trying to think of like the data structure you use inside a basic block because that's kind of simpler than the intra-basic block. That's a whole nother can of worms, but. I think the data structure you use inside a basic block is something like um, for each register, in addition to keeping track of which live values it is, you keep track of which ghost values it has, and you keep track of um, the stride and quarter of that register, meaning like um, the ghost values and live values, like which stride do they use, which quarter do they use, um, right. 
So and they have to be always the rules that they have to always be the same, either it's scalar or stride of of one or stride of two or whatever. Yeah, I, I've written this data structure. I've written a linear scan register allocator. But that yeah, so the uh, difference is the linear scan is that that thing for each register over the entire uh, or, or that that thing for each live value. But for this, you want to do that for each register as you scan along. Of yeah, so the, the data structure that I had basically tracked per byte and had a pointer. I think that's a bit of overkill. You can probably do it per VEC8, I think. Um, but scalars, that, we have to deal with scalars, and those can be a single yeah, byte. Yeah, but then awesome. you have a scalar type where like this VEC8 is full of stuff. Um, right. So you can, you can compress it down that way. Um, but yeah. At the end of the day, you end up having to track like all of the things that are basically the way I did it was I didn't allow things to overlap if they didn't have matching stride patterns. And so, uh, that many, means you can't absolutely calculate pressure. How many of these stride patterns do you actually have them in total? Um, so there's one possible pattern for 64-bit values, two for 32, four for 16. And how many are allowed to overlap? I mean, how many conflicting patterns do you have? They all conflict with each other, right? All? All, well, so a, basically what it comes down to is that a, like, as long, so you don't own, so I, I should back up. I have more stride patterns than that because you have a stride and anything with the same stride and the same start is fine. So if you insist that everything is aligned to, uh, is aligned the right way, then you can get rid of the multiplicity from the phase. But you, as long as the phase matches and the stride matches, um, you're good to go because you can have like, if you have like a four byte strided 16 bit value and a four byte strided 32 bit value, those can interfere nicely as long as they start at the same spot. Um, so you so, can have some into, you can have some things that work nicely together, but the vast majority of your 16 bit values are going to be two byte strided, not four byte. I think what yeah, you want I was gonna say, is, do you really need all those? Like, we need four well, bytes you do is, um, So you have a structure that represents, like, what is the, you divvy the first 64 bits of each VEC8 into bytes, and then you say, which value is at this byte, and what uh, and what stride is the overall VEC8 yeah. at? I, coming up with the data structure to store the information is tedious, but it's not an especially hard problem. Um, the bigger question is if we get to the end and we have to insert fees to resolve the mess. I how think much that should be a going huge to generate, how much problem. pain is that going to be? Because I think that should be a huge to problem. Um, because um, as long as you assume that I think that ghost values that are together kind of stick together, um, then um, you either have these like regular fees, which uh, follow the mask, and then you insert parallel copy instructions that uh, follow the mask, or they're like ghost fees, and then you have to insert no mask instructions. You can either move around just the active parts of uh, a value, or move around like all of them. Um, yeah. Um, but there's, there's going to be other problems, like so the, the problem, the, the, the potential solution we were talking about to the um, pathological, what happens if the two ends of my vector are on opposite ends of the register file case, um, where you split stuff up. I think we will actually have to solve that problem because you can end up, because everything is strided, you can end up with a case where you have enough bytes for a value, but they're in weird places and they're not in a consistent stride that you can use. And so you end up having to like maybe restride something. 
Yeah. Um, so like if an entire register file is full of 16 bit values with uh, four byte strides and suddenly we need a 32 bit value with an eight byte stride, which is a thing that could happen, then we have enough bytes, but the only way we can get at it is if we start repacking some of those 16 bit values to have a two byte stride. Yeah, I think that cannot happen if you statically um, partition the register file, right? Yeah, if you if you can get away with a static partition, all the problems go away. Um, it's just a matter of whether or not static partitioning actually works. And we have enough variation in the different strides, especially if you so if it's a usual GL shader that only deals with 32 bit floats, there are no problems. Everything has a four byte stride. We don't. I think maybe you can assume, maybe you don't assume a static stride, but assume that there's a, still a dynamic partition that at each point in the register file, like it's either assigned to something with a 16 bit stride or a 32 bit stride. Um, um, and then. Yeah, but then you don't, you can't do pre RA spilling without figuring out that partitioning ahead of time, which maybe that's what you do. Maybe you figure out the partition as a first pass. Yeah, it's what I thought. And they, the partition can change uh, outside control flow, but it cannot change inside control flow. And then it's only question of how how much do you overestimate your register pressure doing that, and if it's still worth it or not. Because then you you might have to spill more than actually necessary. But I cannot imagine that it's really that the impact is huge, but that, that's something to test. I mean, you can also calculate this partitioning or the, the theoretical register pressure with, sta uh, with static partitioning and see how far you are away and, and how much more you spill currently versus you would spill then. That I will and run some, some shader database and just calculate the difference between the theoretical spilling using a static partition and and the current spilling. Yeah, I'm a little concerned with doing that simply because our current shader databases that we have right now don't have a lot of stuff that uses 64-bit types or 8 and 16-bit types. And I don't want to, like, I don't want to end up designing something that is pathological in those cases. Um, you probably just need more Android games then. Just get lots of stuff using Medium P. I think oh, we have well, a ton, we have a big ton of Vulkan pipelines. I, I have to ask though. <laughs> yeah, and they yeah. always yeah. get stuff. Um, I mean, yeah, I, I think there's I think there's some exploration that we can do there, and maybe static partitioning is good enough. Um, in in most cases, if all you have is sixteen and thirty two bit types then you're only really going to end up with two vector partitions. You're going to have the uh, four byte stride and the two byte stride. And the uniforms. And the uniforms, yeah. Um, How horrible would it be to just uh, pick the sort of physical stride layout of 16 bit values and then just fix that as a prepass and then assume that you only have one or the other and you're not converting between them on the fly in RA? Um, or if you need to convert between them, just insert those before you do RA? Unfortunately, due to region restrictions, that's a pain in the neck. Um, <laughs> because destinations have to be strided out to at least as big as the source stride. And so anytime you like read the bottom 32 bits of a six, uh, the bottom 16 bits of a 32 bit value, the destination of that has to be, have a stride of four bytes. But then there's Can cases you where you can't pack. have a stride of four bytes. Like how, how, does, how does like extracting the low 16 bits of a 32 bit value like in, in the NUR instruction work then? Um, you end up we end up generating an instruction that has a strided destination where it's strided out to four bytes, but it's a but it's a sixteen bit type. And then you and just can't pack it. 
like you just have to use four byte stride everywhere. Like, um, but there's places we can't use four byte stride, so we so have to insert it to yeah. from. Like we have to insert moves to stride stuff out and pack stuff again sometimes. Okay, so you can do it with a move, but like not with anything else. Yeah, so moves are allowed to break a lot of rules. So moves are allowed to compact things. Oh, and... okay. But then you might be kind of screwed if you need to swap things. Um, I would have uh -huh. a little bit <laughs> We can't do it with XOR. Yeah, you might need to uh, think that through carefully. But I think like, the copies can only happen within the same stride restrictions. Yeah, so you have to make sure when you insert your parallel copy instruction that all of your strides match. And if you don't have a matching stride somewhere, then you have to insert extra moves either at the source of the parallel copy or at the destination to repack things appropriately. <laughs> so, and this is where I, I was talking about how like um, it's nice when you have one pass that just like does all of the insanity like in the parallel copy instruction. So if there is a way to do it, like just just do some crazy sequence of instructions um, in the parallel copy implementation, and then um, you can try to avoid it in the rest of it. But then at least it's that that's kind of contained. Um, I, I mean, it, it might be possible, but I think you might be able to back yourself into a corner where you absolutely have to do a swap across strides. And I don't know if that's, I don't think XOR allows that. Um, I mean, I don't know. But if you can detect, like if you can run a sort of simulated parallel copy lowering and detect that that's the case, you can like insert some extra moves to deal but with it. But the thing is that inserting the extra move is the same as resolving a parallel copy. So the problem is that you'd probably run out of registers, right? Um, well, you can right. reserve. You can always keep one extra register. If that's not the case. That, that's not an issue. So mm. yeah, we could we could reserve a register. In which case, all is solved because I can do a swap with three moves and an extra register. And yeah, and then you don't, and, and all of, you can do whatever crazy parallel copy you want, and then just use this extra register to yeah. resolve. Yeah, the, the extra register just has to be big enough to store the maximum size swap I'll ever need. Um. Uh. Uh, is that the case, actually? Can you do one? Actually, can you do like a scalar XOR um, instruction? Um, but I might not want to swap the ghost channels. Uh, oh, yeah, that's right. Um, um, I would have to think about that. It might be possible with like four or five XOR instructions and appropriate passing <laughs> to make that happen. It gets really like hairy. And um, <laughs> <laughs> at least that's all self-contained. I had to go through a similar sort of thing in IR3 where the um, the 16-bit register in in 16-bit mode, you can only access the lower half of the register file. Um, and then, but then sometimes in the parallel copy lowering code, you can generate um, swap. You have to generate swaps or moves that involve the upper half of the sixth of file as a 16-bit register. Um, and then you just have to suck it up and like insert extra instructions in that case. Did but then at least uh, if it just if everything just works, you can kind of avoid having to deal with it in the rest of register allocation. Do you know what our worst case was um, on old hardware to pack uh, multiple bytes in one register if it's if the source is the same byte, like just duplicating the same byte in one register, and now we do some 
multiply by some crazy magic number to replicate the bytes in the register. But that's all contained in the lowering of parallel copies um, stuff. So uh, I think we could improve that by using byte per mute, by the way. Yeah, on GFX six, I don't think there's well, not not six, of course, but eight <laughs> and above. I think it's all, oh, yeah. yeah. What he meant is it's only on six where you do that. Yeah, it's crazy stuff. Um, yeah, so there winds up being all sorts of hardware insanity that um, the parallel copy lowering generally um, has to deal with. Um, and that's just kind of the way it is. Um, there's the library splitting, which depends on your register file, and then there's the parallel copy lowering, which also heavily depends on what instructions you have. Um, and you, in the end, like those two parts kind of suck, but then the rest of it is very simple. Um, and the, at least, at least the hardware insanity is contained in those two, um, those two parts. Yeah. Um, is there more questions about general, general SSA based register location um, stuff? Because Any questions about the? I never. We never managed to cover the um, register sharing thing that I do in IR three. Um, the um, uh, yeah. variables and the values in the same register. Stacking the same value on in the same register slot if you know that's the same value basically um which is this whole other thing which is kind of forced upon me by io3 not having like the wrong split instruction um no i don't think so i think we're getting towards the end yeah can i, can I ask a question that's unrelated to that um, this is a, so this is an ACO uh, specific question. That um, you know, uh, you know, when you have whole wave mode, and um, on the LRBM backend, we have to we have to dedicate a small number of registers to whole wave mode use. So they're VGPRs, but um, but they're used in whole wave mode for reductions and stuff. And Connor, I think you might have done that fix originally. I can't remember. Yeah. Um, oh yeah, yeah. This, is, this, is there a better um, way of handling that in with um, with this kind of register allocation? So um, you would have a lot of fun with Jason because this is exactly the same problem. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but the way it works in ACO is just you have this uh, linear GPR. It, it's basically reserving a register, but a little smarter. Um, yeah, because we, so there's two things. We have the linear control flow graph and the logical control flow graph, if you remember from earlier. And we just pretend that there's a VGPR, which normally are only live in the in the logical control flow graph. And we say that this one, then we call it the linear VGPR, is live in the linear control flow graph. And um, what we additionally do is that we take care that the, the life range, uh, so that when this variable is created and when it's not needed anymore, that this only goes from uh, from outside control flow to again outside control flow, and uh, this way we can dynamically allocate a, a VGPR and dynamically give it away again. While LVM has to basically reserve it from the whole program. Yeah, from yeah. the whole program. So we are reserving it, but inside each non-uniform region separately. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah thank you. Um, yeah, so I don't think you can get much better than that without dealing with all of the insanity that uh, the cool, was just talking about. The cool thing, though, is that we can also reuse the same concept for um, spilling SGPRs to VGPRs. So we do the same trick, basically, if we want to sp spill some SGPRs and we can spill them to a VGPR by, uh, by also allocating a single VGPR for that region. And um, and use it there, and then we get we free it up again afterwards. So yeah, um, I think LRBM again does that for the whole function. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, it's better than the state it was before, in that was just broken. Yes. So. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah, and I think the overhead of allocating it for the whole program is pretty small because normally you are tight in registers in this region where you allocate it anyway, and you don't really need that register afterwards. So freeing it up doesn't give you a much of a benefit anyways. So mm. I think the difference is really small in this case. And you could also see that when LVM fixed that up, uh, that for example, the performance in the Doom 2016 game increased by like 20%. So yeah. and got close to what um, we achieved. So there isn't really much of a difference anymore by allocating it for the whole program. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. yeah, if there are no more questions, then I'd also just yeah. say thank you for showing up, everyone. Oh, and if I think there were still, um, people were still a little confused and when we were doing IR3 register allocation. <laughs> If anyone has any questions and wants to go through the code, probably now this week is the time. Um, um, but yeah, um, you can always create a separate room afterwards. I know this is a really complicated topic. Uh, certainly not simple to write. You can also uh, just ping us afterwards if you realize you had another question or uh, if just something came to mind or if you were just shy to ask. <laughs> So I, I kind of went through a little bit of it uh, the other day in sorting out that uh, RA validate bug. Um, oh, which yeah. Kinda, I mean, yeah, I mean, it, it kind of helps just to like have something to debug and force yourself to go through it. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. All right, I think that's it. Yeah. Uh, sorry, can I ask uh, something else? Uh, Tim, is there a way to reach you on IRC? Uh, me? Um, uh, no, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I could um, I could give you my email if you want. If I, I'm on IRC at the moment, but I'm not generally on there. Oh, OK. Uh, what, what's your nickname? I, I will just uh, ping you there. And okay, yeah, uh, you can give me your email. Okay. I'm on as NPHCT. Oh, OK, OK. So, so the initials of nice piping hot cup of tea. Sorry, N P H C T. Okay, got yep. it. Thank you. Sorry. Okay, then I think that's all for today workshops. Connor, Daniel, and everyone who was here today, thanks for coming and see you tomorrow. Okay. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Goodbye. Thanks, Bye. Have a nice day. Bye.